hello, greetings from uh, the Ramatosh Ohlone lands in Northern California. I'm excited today to introduce our next speaker um, who is both a indigenous knowledge and Western knowledge, a weaver, I guess, actually a weaver of both of these genres. And so today, um, I just wanna say a little bit more about Rutendo because um, it is just such an amazing experience to, to know her. So Rutendo is an African indigenous knowledge systems practitioner and transdisciplinary researcher from Southern Africa. His professional interests have spanned clinical engineering, healthcare technology, management, socioeconomic development, mathematics, leadership, and fashion design to the interface between science, culture, cosmology, and paradigms of healing. And so today we get to experience that weaving process um, between um, these two systems of thinking. And I'm really excited about this because here in Northern California, we're relying more and more on indigenous science, especially to prevent the massive wildfires. We are now engaging with our tribes here to lead the efforts with our state government. And so this is an exciting time to be working on planetary health and integrating all of these systems of knowledge so that we can create a better future for our kids. So with that, thank you, Rutendo. Thank you so much, Melanie. And uh, it is such a privilege to, to be here, uh, to sit in circle, I believe, with uh, the African community of Planetary Partners for Health and Environment and uh, with the work that you do on this day, but in general. And as uh, Melanie has said, I've been invited to speak about my journey or my experience of uh, weaving tapestries between Western and indigenous knowledge systems. And so this is a, a diagram I love uh, because on the left-hand side, we have modern science and what it looks like and what we know it to be. And this is what's allowing us to communicate uh, through this platform today. But on the right-hand side, we have an indigenous science which is actually the basis upon which this modern science uh, is, uh, is developed. We have the IFA system on the side. It is all ones and zeros in base two, just like the internet that we know, but it's beyond that. We also have base four. We also have the mathematical base eight. We also have the mathematical base 16. So all of that is woven into an indigenous system, uh, which uh, now we know we're able to communicate with in our modern system. For our journey, I'll just ask you to maybe forget the logic, uh, you know, forget my words and maybe just focus on the essence. And so I'd like to start a story with following the way of the weaver. And in following the way of the weaver, I have taken many lessons from nature. And one lesson I've taken, something that really inspires me is the weaver bird, the little finch sometimes. And this bird is uh, so precise in how it weaves tapestries. And these tapestries are woven into its nest. It is incredibly industrious, you know, when one watches it. And uh, it takes strands from wherever it can find them, investigates that they are of the right quality, and then puts them together into a constellation, which we may call a fractal of being. Now, we know that the female bird is very, very uh, precise. And if the constellation is not up to scratch, she will take the whole thread apart, you know, in order for the male to start again. And so this for me is a lesson in industrious precision from nature. And what we learn uh, know from, from the weaver bird is that it continues building. And when it gets into situations of limited resources, such as the Kalahari Desert that we see here, it finds ways of sharing these limited resources. And so whereas where I come from here in southern, in the, in the south, in the savannah, you know, where we have many trees, it's able to build sing single um, nests. In the Kalahari, the social weavers come together to create one mass uh, nest of many nests um, in order to use the limited resources that are available in 
the, the desert. And so this is a lesson in conservation, a lesson in sustainability because of the extremes of uh, temperatures and extremes of conditions that the uh, that happens in um, in the desert. And so for me, it is a lesson in strands of sustainability. And I believe I'm not the only one who has been inspired by these weaver birds. And uh, we see our grandmothers here who have woven in the same way that the, uh, the weaver weaves into fractals, um, for instance, in the baskets that we see um, between us. But what we know is that these uh, our grandmothers were not just uh, a, a, you know, attempting to imitate the ways of the weaver in weaving, but they were also weaving in patterns of the universe. And in weaving in patterns of the universe within these, they were weaving in healing in order to allow us to be in harmony with uh, the patterns of the universe. So this has been my inspiration and it has allowed me to follow the way of the nomad. And as uh, Melanie probably said before, a part of my uh, strands, one of the strands that I have followed is that as a young child, I was very interested in physics and mathematics and science. And uh, then I was really caught by um, the idea that engineering is the application of science for humanity. And so I jumped onto that and became, uh, well, studied into becoming an engineer. And in this, I was looking at what is the external circuitry that we create in order to bring and to develop humanity uh, in, in, in essence. But as I was you know, continuing with that journey, I thought, but how can we actually apply that engineering, you know, which is an application of science for, the, for human development or for the development of humanity into a more healing paradigm? And that took me into biomedical engineering, uh, where I was looking into medical equipment, looking into clinical engineering, as has been said before, really seeking how to apply this engineering into, uh, into the medical field. But my quest for humanity, you know, kept going on. And I then became a nomadic weaver where um, I went to medical school as I was seeking to go deeper into uh, this connection between, you know, how do we develop humanity? But while I was there and while I was doing everything else, I was engaged in African dance. I was engaged in the martial arts, or I still am. Um, you know, I uh, was engaged in cosmology. Um, I became an indigenous healer, a traditional healer, and all the time trying to think where is the connection between, for instance, my first love, which was the engineering application of science for development of humanity, its application towards uh, healing and medicine, and its, its interaction with all these different forms. I did fashion design and all sorts of other things. And But I'd like to focus just on one strand. And uh, I call it into the black hole with the W in brackets. And one of those strands was when I was at medical school. And um, while I was there, I had the opportunity of, well, during ward rounds of being in one of the biggest uh, hospitals uh, here in South Africa. Um, and uh, there was one particular ward where we found um, that there seemed to be a a low ability for children to heal. It was a children's ward. And every time I entered into this ward, interestingly enough, I would end up fainting or passing out, which nobody could understand what was happening. And nobody could also understand why there was such a low rate of recovery of children in this particular ward. Later, um, I then happened to be doing an elective in palliative care, and I happened to be in a hospice in that, uh, in that same township, where many of the children who were from that ward would come through um, when they were in their last days of life. And I, I spent most of my time, you know, ministering to these children um, as part of my requirements, you know, for that elective. But then one day, um, my supervisor, the consultant, a doctor, a pediatrician came to me and, you know, she said, um, Rutendo, tomorrow, leave the stethoscope and leave the white coat at home and come as you are. 
And I could not understand this. And I kept questioning her because I had credits that I had to, uh, to complete. And, you know, she kept saying, leave the stethoscope, leave the, um, leave the, the white coat and come as you are. And when I quizzed her some more, she showed me around the ward and she said, Rutenda, look in that bed. That child should have died 10 days ago. Look in that bed. That child should have died 12 days ago. Look in that bed. That child is going home today. And she said, there's something that you have brought in. There's something that um, you are doing uh, that is outside the realms of medicine that is making children that were supposed to die live. And uh, she said, please come back for the rest of your elective and do whatever it is that you were doing. And uh, she threw me into the black hole and actually discouraged me from continuing with my medical degree. And instead, I went out into the black hole where I then started following the way of the river or the way of indigenous knowledge. Because what I discovered that was um, keeping the children alive was something that is rooted in indigenous knowledge. And I spent a lot of time in nature and especially a lot of time uh, by rivers. And I became very intrigued by the lessons that we have from the various rivers of our continent in particular. But one river was very, very intriguing to me, which is the Niger River. And it is a beautiful river as we can see from West Africa. What's interesting about this river is that it arises from the Guinea Highlands, about 240 kilometers from the Atlantic Ocean. And according to normal science or commonly understood science, this river should take its shortest route to the ocean via that 240 kilometers. Except this river takes a different route. This river goes inland away from the lushness and the highlands into the desert, into the other, into that which has no water. And then it makes a mysterious turn around Timbuktu, you know, where it's going through Niger, going through Benin, going through Nigeria, all the way until it finally empties through the Niger Delta uh, into the Atlantic Ocean at the Gulf of Guinea. Now, what happens during the course of this river's flow is that because of this long drawn out flow of almost 4,400 kilometers, as opposed to 240 kilometers that it have traveled, it loses a lot of its efficiency. It becomes slow and sluggish in many areas. You know, so it becomes a very inefficient river in being able to move this long distance. But in that inefficiency, it becomes incredibly effective in creating the incredible diversity of the Niger Delta, in which more than 40 different types of peoples, and it is one of the highest biodiversity areas on our continent. And so this inefficient river is actually incredibly effective in creating um, uh, diversity, in creating sustenance and sustainability. And the lesson from this river is that it is the way of indigenous knowledge systems. It is the way of the systems that are rooted in our communities, you know, that seek the social context in which all forms of life are an interaction between social and spiritual relations. It is the way of our tacit knowledge um, that is passed orally or through initiation or through demonstration or, or through observation. It is experiential rather than theoretical. And it is inherently linked to the understanding of the environment. And because of this, it is dynamic and constantly adapting. And I came to understand that this obscure course of the Niger River talks to us about nature and the indigenous systems inherent in nature. But other rivers have other stories to tell. The Congo River speaks about the wounding of nature. The Nile River tells us about the principle of ma'at in nature. The Zambezi River tells us about the principle of Ubuntu in nature. And the Orange River tells us about the way of the Bushman in nature. And so nature is a critical teacher. And according to indigenous knowledge, everything is a teacher and in everything lies um, wisdom. But this knowledge, as we know, has been marginalized, it has been illegitimized, it has been invalidated, and it has therefore been chained and kept away from most of us. And certainly with me, you know, having grown up um, learning in a very Western paradigm. 
And so I found myself when I was in the black hole um, in a research chair that really sought to find how we can find an ecology of knowledges. And in finding an ecology of knowledges, how do we propagate cognitive justice and cognitive justice being the right of different traditions of knowledge to coexist without duress. And in this, we brought together on numerous occasions, um, professors within the academia from all uh, uh, disciplines, from quantum physics to economics to law, uh, you name it, with indigenous knowledge holders. And it took a, pro a process of about six years where at first there was a huge gap between them and they found that they were not having any way of interacting. And through the cognitive justice, through transformation by enlargement, enlarging the space to allow different ways of being to be, we found that after a while, eventually this gap started to close and they started finding that actually there were common languages that they could find between the highly academic Western trained and the indigenous rooted grassroots knowledge holders. And in the same process, I started embarking on a study that looked at how we can look at paradigms of healing through the lenses of science, culture, and cosmology, and how we can therefore allow different paradigms or different ways of healing to communicate. And precisely, uh, especially focusing on how indigenous African healing methods can uh, interact with um, uh, Western um, healing, but also with a bridge in terms of bringing as I said, I'm a martial artist, um, traditional Chinese medicine into the conversation. And so this became a conversation um, of my studies. And in this, I really was looking into what we mean, how can we approach indigenous knowledge systems? And for that, I realized that it was really important to focus on cosmology. Uh, cosmology as an underpinning and underlying a basis of everything. And here we're talking about the origin, the structure and evolution of the universe. We're talking about causality and interdependence. Uh, we're talking about the lens with which to construe and interpret and understand and interpret one's world. And, we're, and cosmology can be seen as a worldview, as a way of and allowing us to find a way through social landscapes allowing us to go through the search for knowing self and other, a way that informs our decisions and behavior, a way that allows us to be both individualistic or collective, reductionist or holistic, and a way that actually informs the underlying tenets of culture, uh, which was one of the ways in which I was seeking to look into these medical paradigms. Um, but then in this, I found there was a bit of a conflict uh, in as much as conflict I'd find in my martial arts, where, of course, when we look at cosmology from a scientific paradigm, we have the Big Bang Theory and how the cosmos came into effect. And, but then we know that the dominant scientific worldview started propagating from the 17th uh, um, age of, century age of enlightenment. And we saw many great thinkers uh, coming through that time of enlightenment. But what we also saw was that there was a move away, there had been a steady move from the 13th century on away from nature per se, and a lot more into reason and a lot more into a, mechan a me mechanistic way of seeing the world, seeing us all as machines. And therefore we started seeing determ deterministic materialism, reductionism, objectivity, dualism, monism, natural selection and dichotomy and bi binary opposition of being as the ontology of modern science and the ontology that has dominated our, our modern paradigm. And what we also see is that this also created many silos of being in which things became more and more specialized into different silos and therefore making it difficult for this interrelatedness that uh, was once there in nature to exist. On the other hand, when we, when we look into the indigenous um, uh, cosmology, we look at this word here, NTR, and I've been spelling nature in a particular way, um, because when you take out the vowels, we then have the consonants of NTR. And when we look at from our indigenous cosmology, 
what we mean by NTR. It's, it's actually what we call Nater. And it's actually uh, that which tells about us about two realms of being. It tells us about the subjective and objective realm. And it tells us about a being that synthesizes and pervades life in all realms, from the nothingness, the void that pre uh, comes before the Big Bang, so to speak, to the objective realm, which is our consciousness will, which is our energy matter, which is all that we are now. And this being that uh, synthesizes life in both the void and the uh, uh, physical reality is what we call nature. And this is what we see as the root of the word nature, as the root of the word natura, as the root, root of the word, the essence or that which is neutral. And so this has been my journey in actually becoming an advocate for nature, which is actually rooted in nature. And from the terror, we then see that there is a causative dynamic life force or power that was responsible for all of creation and in the universe, which we call Ndu. And this is this, this all pervasive force is the subjective matter of the subjective realm of this that we call the terror. And we see Ndu in Ubuntu that we have spoken about earlier. Where here we say umuntu gumuntu gabantu, mutu kimutu kabatu, munu munu panevanu, which is that a person is a person through other persons or through other persons. Ubuntu. But what's really important here is the into aspect. It is this consciousness which tells us that I am because we are. And this Ubuntu, what we find is that when we move beyond just the interrelatedness or togetherness between persons or people or humans, actually tells us about the uh, Ndu that uh, manifests as Muntu, which is reasoned beings or persons, Ndu that manifests as Kintu, which is unreasoned beings, which is the minerals, which is the environment, which is all things that are acted upon by Muntu or Bantu, which is our persons or reasoned beings which is actually about time and space, which is hantu, or which is kuntu, which is the intangible, which are modalities. And then we have trees that actually are actually part of muntu, which are that which is that which moves between the different realms because trees allow us to move between the realms according to our indigenous knowledge of the ancestors and those that are yet to come. And so Ubuntu is in two in the, in, in the animate. Ubuntu is in two in the inanimate. Ubuntu is in two in cycles and all the different cycles of being. And Ubuntu is in two in the intangible. And so we see that in two is the force in which being and beings coalesce. It is the basic essence that unifies the universe. It is the essence of life. It is an imminent or spiritual force. And it is also a transcendent or spiritual force outside. It is interrelatedness, interconnectedness, interdependence between all spheres of being. It is intrinsic, it is extrinsic, and it denotes harmony and balance. And in other parts of Africa, this is known as ma or mia or ma'at. It is the interdependence, interrelatedness, and interconnectedness between all that is. The next uh, principle that I found myself working very deeply with in the black hole is that of Sankofa. Uh, which is an Akan um, Adinkra symbol that we get from Ghana. And usually we know it as something that tells us about historical recovery. It is that which tells us that it is okay to look into the past in order to, into our present in order to create a greater future. But when we move beyond this anthropocentric view of Sankofa, when we move beyond it just being about how we are, as humans relate, we find that Sankofa is actually our ancestors, African ancestors telling us about a universal feedback system. It tells us about the universal feedback system that is found in everything. It is found in the body, in sugar regulation, homeostasis. It is found in psychology. It is found in sales and in the market and production. It is found in engineering, in our operational amplifiers. It is found in the environment, in our predator-prey cycles. And it is found in that which creates the, the destructions that we're seeing in the world today. So when we move beyond that, we see that Sankofa is actually systems thinking or systems theory. It is actually that which tells us about positive and negative feedback. And when we see that it shows us uh, in the various ways, which I'm not going to go into today, of positive and negative feedback, we see that it has another sign, which is this, which looks very much like a heart. 
And that is because Sankofa tells us that it is an injunction to love. So it is all connected. And in the same way as if we go into our Taoist uh, practices and we see that the same cosmology that underlies um, medicine, that underlies cosmology is the same cosmology that underlies, for instance, the martial arts. In our African traditions, we also find the same, this and do, this sankofa, and many other principles which I haven't covered are all that which are underlying that connect us all to all that is. And when I started deep diving into this black hole, I then started finding a convergence. I then started finding indigenous ways of knowing, allowing me to see into the uh, quantum ways of knowing. And I realized that when we move from the um, mechanistic world view that has dominated uh, modern science into a more quantum worldview or a more cosmological worldview, we start seeing that there are all of these relatednesses happening. We start seeing that, you know, Hunt just tells us about the theory of relativity. When we speak about particle wave duality, it is, it is that which is emanating from Ubuntu. When we speak about the indivisibility of nature from a quantum perspective, that is Ubuntu. When we speak about the participatory universe, that is a principle of Ma'at. Chaos theory tells us about indigenous healing. The binary code tells us about indigenous oracles. Probability tells us about divination. The uncertainty principle is what is used in ritual. And quantum theory is actually all about indigenous knowledge systems. And so my deep dive into the deep hole, uh, into the whole, into the universe, can perhaps be summed up by a great theoretical physicist, or David Bohm, who said that the pervading or reductionist fragmentation of human consciousness is now preventing mankind from working together for the common good and even for its survival. There's a need for an inclusive borderless paradigm, stressing that both relativity theory and quantum theory are notions that imply that the undivided wholeness of the universe would provide a much more orderly way of considering the general nature of reality. Consciousness is the essential nature of the universe. And when we go into our indigenous knowledge systems, and do is what we mean by consciousness. And this and do is what is pervaded in the terre, which is what we know as nature. And so we see that Ubuntu takes us into deep ecology. It tells us about science and spirituality. It tells about us about cosmological, biological, and social networks. It tells us about how we can go into diversity like the Niger River as opposed to monocultures. It tells us that we're a part of as opposed to apart from nature. It speaks to us about sustainable ecosystems, and it speaks to us about sustainable communities. And so my quests in the strands that I've been picking up over the years has been seeing whether what seems like parable worlds can actually merge. And in this, I have gone to our oldest ancestors, what we call the Batwa or the Bushmen or the Khoisan here in Southern Africa. And they tell us about the Ngum. And they tell us that when we follow the way of nature, we need to understand that Ngum, which is the life force that is animated by the Ndu, then we have to you know, have that into, into, into the land. But what we're seeing is the crisis that we're having at the moment is because the Ngum of the land is depleted, of the environment is depleted. And so the Bushmen tell us to go into first principle and track nature. They tell us to go into first principles and trans nature or transcend nature. They tell us to go into first principles and dance nature. They tell us about custodianship versus control. They tell us about coexistence versus dominion or domination. They speak to us about ecological sustainability. And through this, through acknowledging the ngum within us as the precept of do, we're then able to go not only into restoration, but a regeneration. And so in my deep dive, I have found that indigenous knowledge or the merging of indigenous knowledge as a deeply scientific knowledge can help us as a window in which to view the challenges of our times, uh, whether it is the climate change that we're experiencing and whether it is that we're able to bring in the various principles that bring on the various elements to hold and be custodians as our indigenous adults would, would be 
to allow things to thrive from, um, from, from even the technological destruction that has taken place and to allow all the elements, to allow the waters to thrive, to allow the fires to, ride, to thrive, to allow the earth to thrive, to allow the air to thrive and to allow it all to thrive within the precepts of indigenous knowledge. And so when we do this, we realize um, a few years ago, we had the biggest cyclone in Southern Africa uh, or in the Southern, uh, uh, Southern Hemisphere, which coincidentally was given a Shana name um, going through the alphabet of Idai. Now, Idai in Shona means love, but not love as a verb, as a noun, but love as an injunction. It is an injunction, a command to love. And so this cyclone that caused so much destruction and that implicated upon so many of our children actually was a remembering of injunction to love and a remembering that we are all connected. But if we apply that Sankofa sign, that heart, then we're able to, uh, to be um, one with the, with the universe. And so in my current uh, work uh, in the collective weaving, um, I find myself weaving in various uh, um, uh, ways in terms of bringing the indigenous knowledge, for instance, in different um, organizations such as Asagaya, which is really looking at how we look at the environment um, and how we protect the sacred sites that are the organs of keeping the environment um, going. Where we look at activism, ancient wisdom and alternatives through Earthrise Collective or through Ancient Wisdom Foundation, all is working with the confluence between communities, between indigenous knowledge, between our science, between our technology and how it impacts upon the health as we go on. We look um, um, where we call for an ecocentric protection of all sacred natural sites based on an earth centered approach that places the sacredness, integrity and regeneration of these sites at the heart of decisions affecting them, regardless of their perceived use usefulness of their material value or importance to humans. Sacred natural sites hold intrinsic value for the continuity of life on earth and cannot be monetized. They must therefore remain outside of the commercial value chain and receive protection, which is part of the work that we do in working with the environment, in working with the indigenous way, with the worldwide indigenous peoples um, uh, um, uh, uh, charter, and which all takes us back into the cycles of Ubuntu. We followed the way of the river and the way of the Niger River in particular. And as it went through its ineffectiveness, inefficiency, it became effective in creating the, uh, the Niger Delta, which we have said is responsible for an incredible biodiversity and diversity of life. And when we look at the way of the river, we realize that this river is actually speaking to us as all of these tributaries are the children um, of our future. And so when we follow the way, the obscure way of the indigenous way, we may find that we have an opportunity for the children to thrive. So my journey has taken me full circle. It's taken me from the IKS being at the periphery to being at the core of my endeavors. It has taken me deeper into science. It has taken me into a lived versus theoretical knowledge. It has shown that all is connected, all is relational. We're all part of a continuum. And if we're able to bring it into being, then we may have systems of sustainability and health beyond the Anthropocene. And when we thrive, you know, then the children will thrive. And then we'll be able to move from the bird of Sankofa into the bird of the, the, the Ubuntu Ma'at, which is uh, the, the, um, the, the ostrich, which then allows us to move into Bennu, which is the phoenix that is being able to rise from the ashes of the destruction of our common world into a new regenerative future. And as our ancient Bushmen say, a dream is not a dream until it is shared by the entire community. And so I um, am grateful for the dream of Akofi and the community that it shares it with. And that through all the work that Akofi does, we may be able to have a sustainable future. I thank you. <laughs>